You consider have symptoms. Based on our screening protocol, you have to continue on self-isolation. And self-isolation is required if you have symptoms to prevent possibly spreading COVID-19 to others. Okay. If you are isolating with symptoms, even if mild, you must self-isolate indoors and separate from others in the household. It is okay to be outside on your own property, including your backyard or desk, as long as you are not physically interacting or near other people. You should not be going on walks or around your neighbor. I, I'm not going to leave my apartment. The only way I'm leaving my apartment is to go to get tested. That's it. Yeah, you can do that just for your life. Yeah. If you're isolating with no symptoms, solidary walks are okay as long as you maintain a two meter distance from other people at all times. You must maintain proper hand hygiene and avoid contact with shared services, including public access doors, handrails, elevators, pedestrian crossing buttons, playground equipment, etc. Household members should stay in another home or place as early as possible. Especially if they have a compromising system or chronic health condition. If you are sharing your home, stay in a room that is separate from other members of the household. Use a separate bathroom if you can. Flush the toilet with a meat down. If you live alone or your entire household is self isolated, make sure you have someone who is able to check in on you and can provide additional support or supplies you require. Request that person take all these precautions to avoid infection. Do not have visitors to your home, do not go to work or school. Do not go to any public areas, including places of worship, stores, shopping malls, and restaurants. Practice good hand hygiene, cover coughs and sneezes, cancel or reschedule all appointments, let them know you are on self-isolation. Do not take buses, taxis, or ride sharing where you will be in contact with others. Ask family, friends, delivery service to drop off any food essential items that are needed. Be in different and common areas once a day, counters, table tops, doorknobs, bathroom fixtures, Toilet, phones, keyboards, tablets, remote controls. If you need to leave home for a pressing necessity like getting your COVID-19 testing, wear a surgical mask while you're out. If you have to remove or adjust mask, ensure hand washing before and after. Are you able to self-isolate at home? I yes. am. That is, I am able to, yes. Okay, perfect.
to All Health Can Stop Us. This is Jeff Cliff. Oh, I should actually probably turn my microphone on so my guests know that I'm talking. Uh, but this is a weekly broadcast and podcast and record of the time, an alternative to the RIA, the ACE, the IFPI, NDAA, and John Gormley here at Saskatchewan. And today I have three special guests. Uh, all three have been on the show before. We have Larry Newfeld. Are you still there? Oh. Yep, yeah, I'm here. And John Klein, otherwise known as Sask Boy. Hello. And Albatross. Oh, hello. All right, you are all coming in loud and clear. So we were talking. Um, obviously, COVID is the big topic that is still going on a year later. Who would have thought that this would have taken a year to resolve itself? But it has definitely affected all of our lives, and in particular, Albatross. Let's start with you. You were mentioning that there was a lockdown in Russia, and that that lockdown has directly impacted you since we've spoken last. And so let's start with getting into that. How how has COVID been treating you? Oh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks to this episode, COVID uh, has messed with me so much that I uh, lost my place in the university and had to completely leave uh, outside from Moscow. So, uh, at least I still have my job. <laughs> and you're still doing open source development as well, on top of that? Oh, yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> And so on Saskboy, your side, so as far as the university students living on campus at the University of Regina, any word on how that has been impacted and are they still living in dorms, etc.? Back in March, the dorms were closed down and students had to go home for the most part. However, in September, with the visa rules changed by the federal government and uh, various arrangements, they were able to bring over 200 students back onto campus to live. and. They're still there to this day, as far as I understand. And the, uh, the president uh, is an uh, interim president, uh, Tom Chase. He's uh, been trying to uh, very cautiously operate the university, have most employees and faculty work from home, where the uh, risk of spreading the plague is far diminished. And so I've had a, a good deal of respect for how he's talked about uh, being cautious and looked at other universities around the world that have had uh, outbreaks when they've tried to bring students back on the main campus. And so things have been uh, done fairly well. Well, uh, and there hasn't been uh, large outbreaks on campus. There's been minor ones reported. And at, over the summer, there were only a few hundred people on campus at any given time, when typically there'd be over 10,000 people uh, on main campus. So back to Albatross, as far as how many people are, were in your particular university, how many people would normally be there, and how many people are there now? And how has there been an outbreak there, et cetera? I don't think so. Uh, there's actually thousands of people working at the university. I say working, I mean uh, both uh, professors and students. So, yeah, I guess not so much actually at the university. It's just me being uh, being that prepared to, uh, to uh, remote uh, learning at the university. So, yeah, uh, it's mostly my problem, not like university had to, to live with me. <laughs> Interesting, because I've noticed that the Russian numbers are looking at least similar, maybe per capita, to Canadian numbers in terms of right now in both of our countries, there's a big boom in cases going on, and the cases per day is accelerating on both of our sides. Oh, that's, that's another thing, because uh, uh, we had a lockdown, but I guess we can uh, do another one, and uh, people are still more, uh, are still going to their jobs, uh, are still going to university. As far as I know, it's uh, just two weeks ago, uh, my friends who so still uh, who are still uh, in that university... Like still in uh, classes? Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. They weren't on the boards and learning. So it's a bit obvious to uh, most Russian people why there is a virus with corona. So on to Larry's side, we were mentioning a little earlier on the Saskatchewan context, where our government here has was elected a couple of weeks ago on a promise, a campaign promise, not to have a lockdown, and has since tried to take a middle ground between shutting the economy down to deal with 
COVID and not doing anything at all and just kind of looking like you're doing something. So as far as reducing the numbers or at least trying to keep the numbers from going exponential, how has that been going at the provincial level from your perspective? It's been going horribly. Like, and it was a ridiculous promise that the Premier made in the first place saying, oh, we will lock down. You know, I promise not to do a lockdown. When all like healthcare experts were predicting that numbers were going to expect to be going up. So he shouldn't have been making promises like that. He should have been saying, I will do everything that I can if elected to protect public health. That should have been the promise that he should have made rather than saying, I won't do a lockdown. So and now we're finding out ourselves in a situation where we are seeing we're easily breaking like records at this point. And yet we are still having businesses open that we had closed when we were like an early part of the pandemic, when we had like the first lockdowns. Numbers were much lower at that time. But that was they did that at that time so we could get our healthcare system prepared for a situation like this that we were expecting to happen later on. And now when we see the numbers increasing like we are now, the premier is still keeping things open at this point. And yes, like you were saying, a middle ground. And we should, we can't be taking a middle ground at this point. He is putting, he keeps talking about the economy. You won't have an economy to save if you have people like filling up our healthcare system. You're going to destroy the economy. It should be so, basic common sense. So, so that's and actually kind be, of a, a good point, I think, that to mention that here in Saskatoon, it's my understanding that our ICU beds are full and our healthcare system, at least as of one or two days ago, was at capacity. Like we are, if it gets any worse, we're already at the point where people who are getting sick are being pushed over to other hospitals. But I'm curious on the Russia context, are the ICUs full? Was there a healthcare system that was functioning too overwhelmed? What is the healthcare system like uh, in terms of, and how is COVID impacting it down there? Uh, I can actually say that uh, for this whole year, I never visited a doctor, and that's actually just being watching me. <laughs> uh, so I don't know if... So on John's side, as far as the provincial government, specifically, wasn't it Brad Wall complaining about you along these lines, making a big deal out of something like COVID? I've lo- lost the link, so... I posted a bitter, sore loser tweet after the uh, SAS party uh, got their majority and complained about the short-sightedness uh, of the electorate who returned the SAS party to power. And he posted it on his Twitter and Facebook and sends his angry trolls at me. That's what happened in late October. And yet, here we are now, a month later, or pretty close to a month later, and the healthcare systems at capacity. We're starting to see some deaths from COVID. Certainly, the, the case numbers are going up. And so, from your vantage point, what should have been done differently, etc.? Well, like Larry mentioned, it was irresponsible of the Premier to say that there wouldn't be a lockdown because that gave a, a wink, wink, nudge, nudge signal to people that don't want to be socially responsible and want to just go and do their own thing to their own advantage at the detriment of everyone else who needs our health care system. <clears throat> There's already doctors in the province, uh, hundreds of them that have written to the Premier and said that we're at capacity, we're over capacity, what are you doing? You're, you're stressing us out. And the people that are talking, like the former CEO of the Saskatchewan Health Authority uh, the other day posted something, what looked like a conspiracy theory that COVID deaths are being misreported and that it's actually the flu or something, that kind of conspiracy language that you find on the internet commonly now, and posted uh, statistics suggesting that our ICUs and hospitals are not full, while doctors are saying that they are. And part of the problem is that they're inflating the number of COVID cases with the capacity of the ICUs and forgetting that there are other people that need ICUs. And so total ICU capacity, if it reaches that many COVID cases, that means it's totally displaced everybody else with cancer surgeries, recovering from cardiac arrests like I once did. And those people will not recover and will not survive in hospital. So they'll be causing deaths. And that's what the Premier is ultimately pushing for with his half measure, let's keep the economy open as much as possible and not do a lockdown, which was successful 
successful in the first place. So back on to uh, Larry's side, one of the questions that was asked to me this week from someone who's not normally engaged in the political issues of our day was along the lines of like, why do I care? Why do I get all riled up when it comes to issues like COVID and that sort of thing? And it, I could tell in your voice that there was a little bit of uh, anger on, on that side of things on your side. So for the people who would ask you that same question, why? It's like, okay, so there are people dying in the hospital. There are people who are, would normally get treatment for heart attacks and cancer, et cetera, who are now on the verge and on the cusp of being pushed out. But why do you care specifically? Well, I simply care due to the fact that it doesn't just hurt an individual person. It's a domino effect. It has, it hurts everyone when something like this happens. So an individual might go, well, it's not affecting me personally. I don't have anybody in my family that maybe has gotten it at this point, for example. Well, just think, how is that impacting maybe your, the people around you, like their job situation? Or like John was saying, maybe you have like somebody who, who got sick or something like that. Maybe they had a heart attack or they have, uh, they need to go in for some sort of surgery. But then it's, oh, they can't get into the hospital or it's like they have to be there's not a bed for them so it's like they have to the hospitals make have to make hard choices about who they're going to be able to keep in the hospital when it's those people need to stay and recover there so it's having an impact on everybody even though people might go well you know it hasn't hit me yet it's not something i have to deal with like personally i haven't got covid they might say it's a domino effect it impacts everybody it impacts our economy it impacts individuals it impacts your family in different ways so you look at it that way and that's what gets me upset is it's not just it, because it impacts everybody in various ways it's not just uh, catching covid but it's other things that are happening and that's what people should think about when they maybe make a statement like, well, you know, I don't think it's such a big deal. And if people that are working in the healthcare system, they've not seen these impacts, I think. And their people are kind of like distance from that. But we are we should be paying attention to our health professionals, paying attention to our nurses, paying attention to our doctors. They are dealing with this directly and they know there's a problem and they're sending out the warning signals and our government's ignoring it. So like, speaking of the can't do that care providers, I noticed John, you've been posting a good couple of reports from doctors and nurses as of late about basically the warnings that we've been ignoring and how close we are to the brink and etc. I'm actually just kind of curious like how many of these reports have you gotten and have you considered making like a blog post just of that? of like just the full collection of nurses and doctors, both in Saskatchewan and elsewhere, that are warning us of what's going wrong here. That was the focus actually of my blog post uh, a few hours ago. Oh, I must, uh, I, I just missed it then, sorry. Yeah. I, I didn't make it specifically that, but I did highlight the former health CEO who had conspiracy theory and the, like what Larry mentioned is excellent of saying how there's only so many beds. But and on top of that, there's only so many nurses and doctors and you can't have a bed without a nurse to operate the machines. And that's what a doctor in Weyburn was explaining on uh, Facebook. I saw that today through uh, Alec Kuros, who's been also sharing a lot of information that he finds uh, regarding doctors sending out the warnings signals. There's an Alberta doctor that the other day had a viral tweet that made an impact and was explaining about him and others gowning up to try to save people's lives and, and other people that talked about how they tell somebody that they should phone their loved ones because they're about to be intubated and they won't get to speak to them again unless they recover, which is in most cases, as I understand it, is once you're on a ventilator, most of them don't survive. It could be better than that now, but at one point, especially in Italy and now um, March, that was the reality for people. So it's tragic. And these numbers about how many beds we have free in the ICU don't even take into account whether we'll have enough staff to operate them because it very quickly, we could lose all of our nurses that could operate them, both the sickness and death. And then replacing doctors in Saskatchewan has never been easy. If we have doctors passing away from this, there'll be long lineups for months and months for people to get appointments with doctors, which which will kill more people. Uh, on top of that, we'll probably have long lineups, in my opinion, for doctors like cardiologists, because there's a high number of people that get long COVID disorders and they get heart injuries and other circulatory system injuries that they're able to detect weeks and months after they've recovered. Mm -hmm. So they haven't uh, fully recovered. And, and I question the media on including the government's recovered statistics, because everyone from the premier down to people publishing these statistics like to say how many people have recovered 
but there isn't good medical understanding yet of what recovered actually means. They know all, we know for a fact that all of them haven't yet recovered pre-infection conditions. So if that is a significant percentage, maybe our healthcare system will spend years or decades overwhelmed just by the injuries from COVID infecting a huge number of our population. I did notice, I was looking through the job postings at SAS Jobs and at the SHA itself this week, and there was tons and tons of postings for nurses. So clearly they want more nurses than they actually have. But back on Albatross's side, we were talking a little bit before we started on the Russian vaccine and how there was some skepticism as far as that specific vaccine in terms of the Russian context. So what is going on with the Russian vaccine that at least we heard about out here in the West? Well, the vaccine, well, the Russian vaccine is uh, it's quite like a Schrodinger's cat thing because I think it exists. I think it exists in some form, but it's just not uh, yet very well tested. And uh, they just uh, don't want to apply this on humans yet. However, authorities already said we have the vaccine. We already like tested it, but uh, in reality, of course, it's not. So when it is made available, will you get the Russian one or will you wait for one of the other vaccines to come around first? I will wait for the actual vaccines, yeah, and both Russians and both other ones uh, will do with the human, will do with the human's organs uh, and uh, will they actually work and only then decide if we need that. Which Maybe the, you know, not all the medicines are good actually. <laughs> I mean, the, the consequences of taking the medicine may be worse than letting your immune system solve the problem with the virus. And you mentioned though at the beginning that you did trust the Russian science system and that there's something there too, presumably when they start applying this vaccine to human beings in Russia, if they haven't already, there'll be at least someone observing to see what happens. Is that an accurate assessment? Uh, my belief in the Russian science comes from uh, all the real people I know who uh, works on the virus stuff uh, from the mostly biologists. So I do believe there is a good specialist to work on the vaccine. So I think it actually exists. You know, however, there's a reason why it's not uh, yet released, right? Hmm. Well, uh, so my assumption is just it's just not very well tested. And while that's going on, Larry, I noticed you posted something, I think it was a CBC link, saying something along the lines of that Canada was last in line for vaccines. And a couple of people have posted the various accounts that in the 90s, our PC government under Mulroney undercut our national ability to manufacture vaccines. So whatever vaccines we're going to be getting, assuming any of them work, are going to be from places like China, the EU, or the United States. Now, I guess, one, is that an accurate assessment? And two, I've heard elsewhere that we were front in line and that other countries were complaining about Canada being in the front of the line. But I saw from your link that it was at the end of the line. So have you heard this kind of conflicting report or what is your take on that? Well, the link that I have posted, I, maybe that's the one you're talking about, but it actually uh, the head of uh, Moderna said that Canada wasn't like last in line, uh, like some people were maybe saying. So we're supposed to be still among uh, the first countries to get uh, actually the vaccine provided to us. We're maybe not going to be like, you know, the very first, but we're not the last of the line when it gets the countries like actually getting it. Uh, according to the, I guess we were in the, among the initial people to sign the contracts, like the initial countries that is to sign the contracts with them in the early stages. So we will be getting the vaccines uh, sooner than some other countries. Uh, the only thing is like at this point, we don't know, no timeline has been announced, like how they're going to do it. Like uh, the federal government is not saying like, okay, this is when we're going to start deploying the vaccine. This is our plan for how we're going to roll it out. And I've seen uh, like in question period, like with the prime minister, uh, he kind of ducks around the question. It seems like he's not giving like firm timelines, which is not good. He should really be like, there's other countries that have actually rolled out a plan. They have a plan ready that they're saying, this is how we're going to do it. We've got the vaccine. This is when it's going to start. This is the way we're going to roll out the whole thing. So uh, there's information uh, coming out, you know, he's recruiting like the military is going to help logistics for this. So there's little bits and pieces that he's sort of putting out there. 
but it's really leaving like provinces out uh, out there like dangling in the wind, basically, we, and everybody else not knowing what's going on. So it's not really fair to healthcare professionals or uh, business people or individuals who need a, need a vaccine whose health are at risk, not knowing exactly how this is going to happen. Where is the plan? Other countries are doing it. Is it too much to ask that our own government actually, like our federal government, work the, with the provinces and actually provide a plan where we know it's coming out? So we're not less in line, but we don't know exactly how it's going to roll out. How is this going to happen? We should have something like this that's certainly available. And going on the fact of uh, vaccine production, it was actually uh, uh, a conservative government that shut down like our, our national lab that produced one of the Kanawha laboratories. They were the ones who produced vaccines for Canada, and that was actually shut down in the past. That yeah, was and I'd imagine also laboratory. probably other countries as well, was my understanding of it. Yeah, it's so short-sighted. Like, you know, when you see things like this happening, we could be in a much better position at this point if we had like a national vaccine lab. Governments after that, not only conservative and liberal governments, didn't look at that as like a big hole in, uh, in our preparation like for problems in the future to not have a national vaccine lab. That's pretty short-sighted. Uh, so, uh, John, looked like you were trying to have been looking at that. You were trying to flag like something there, John? Yeah, well, I, I was thinking about uh, how the Premier in Saskatchewan uh, back in May or April, uh, prior to uh, the reopened Saskatchewan plan, was promising us that the, uh, the virus reproduction rate was under one and that we would take steps in the plan to return it to a diminishing virus amount if infections started to rise. That was the implication. I found a tweet from April, about April 18th, indicating from a SAS party supporter that was their clear understanding of what the Premier meant from his comments about how he would reopen the province. And when it eventually happened, and we were supposed to be prepared with more than 4,000 tests a day and the ability to contact trace, the willingness supposedly of scaling back the reopening to where virus reproduction would go under a rate of one and not be spreading exponentially like it has been for months now and it obviously was a complete lie from the premier and that i think it would bother me more if i hadn't known that he was a liar for so many years i mean he's first time i encountered him on tv he was on ctv nationally saying that saskatchewan's uh, climate emissions were good which <laughs> was a, a total fabrication and he was the environment minister at the time he knew better and he still said it anyway so i mean I, i've had no respect for him because he's a, a bald-faced liar and has no honor. So switching gears a little bit on uh, Albatross's side, because I kind of asked on Larry's side, like the why care about important things. And one of the important things in your world, as I mentioned before, is you're a Husky Fediverse client. And you mentioned that you've recently been pushing changes upstream for that. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. I got free time to work on uh, Husky again. Uh, so I'm just started to work on it today again. I uh, started by the second. Uh, starts or so work on on this again uh, just today uh, so I think uh, I wasted all this uh, day just to synchronize the codes with upstream and it's not something easy because upstream added much more uh, must not specific things like announcement and uh, personal account uh, notes which are not in clear on my head but uh, another thing, so it's uh, updated some some dependencies uh, that uh, I have also to, uh, to update in my own codes. So, so on, on that uh, side, it's, it's not, uh, so the, it's, the, the it's reason... Not interesting, uh, it's, it's, it's just uh, very time-consuming, <laughs> mostly. So as far as the reason why you would do this big updating of dependencies dance and syncing with upstream, is there something upstream that you wanted? that you were unable to get unless you synced to a newer version? Or was it purely because it just hasn't been done in a while, so you decided to do it? Because I know during the last show you had said that you weren't going to, to sync to upstream anymore, and you weren't going to give any changes back after they had kind of ticked you off a bit. Yes, I think uh, I'm, uh, I'm syncing the codes uh, because if I want to uh, grab something uh, useful for me, uh, it uh, wouldn't be easy if I do, if I want to uh, synchronize all other stuff, uh, because uh, it's the code that uh, depends on other parts, and uh, it's uh, either I'm not synchronizing at all, or uh, I do this all the time. Well, the, the main problem, I didn't do this for a month, so 
I usually uh, did that uh, once in a week, but since uh, it was so long, it, uh, it became harder, and, and it took uh, all day, all day for me to figure out what the changes in the upstream. What's about sending them back? Uh, I think I changed my mind on this uh, since. Uh, after releasing it, uh, I found out that uh, past workers are not uh, uh, are not uh, great bad guys. You know, they are mostly okay, and Fork uh, is mostly friendly to them. Uh, so I decided to upstream the bug fixes, uh, maybe uh, some migrations. Uh, there's a big task in the Tusky code uh, to migrate all the Java code to the Kotlin. I can say I'm working on that, but I'm trying to not write <laughs> any more code in Java uh, to, not <laughs> to not increase uh, the job for myself in the future. Makes sense. So on John's side, this idea of dependencies being upgraded in software that our projects depend on, I'm just curious if any of your projects have had this problem of like libraries or dependencies that they depend on being updated and basically forcing upstream projects to into this kind of almost forced obsolescence-like upgrade cycle. Have you seen that at all? I fortunately haven't had to do programming in a very long time. I, I mean, I, I think I have an account on Git Hub and, and that sort of thing, and I still try to keep my software up to date and stay, keep in touch with a bit how it works, but I haven't had to commit changes to the code or do any of that good stuff that's involved there. Uh, most of my computer involvement is supporting users to, uh, I mean, this year was a, a challenge, an unwelcome challenge maybe, but I was prepared for it because we uh, had to go online at where I work. And so converting uh, thousands of people and, and hundreds of staff people to be able to, to work and teach remotely, it was a hectic march. And fortunately, uh, we were able to keep the uh, workplace open and going. Our department was declared an essential service. And even though our pay didn't increase as a result of that, like it did for uh, grocery store workers, we were able to keep our jobs and helped other people keep their jobs because we were able to keep operating and, and useful throughout the pandemic so far. So on Larry's side, I noticed, I think it was you who posted a petition for, I think it was Love Laws employees who were at one point as essential service workers given a, a heroism raise, but that was only during March when numbers were like, what, 20 per day, 10 per day, and now we're at like 400 per day, 300 per day. And the petition I think is for the raise to come back. Do you want to mention that a bit? Yeah, like that's uh, something that really should never have been eliminated like in the first place, like as we're entering in the situation where we're seeing like these numbers going up. The profits that the, these companies are making, like that Loblaws, for example, Walmart and all these others are making, they are going through the roof. They're making so much money, yet the people that are putting their lives on the line are the retail workers, like that are in their stores. And they're, they were getting like the additional $2 per hour, they were getting that. And then they all cooperated together with these retailers and they took it away. And it's like cheapening the lives of these people that are really, they're out there providing a vital service that we need. They're putting the food on the shelves that we need and they're putting the things there that we need to be using. And it's just, it's very reasonable to, you know, just provide that $2 an hour increase. And honestly, they can afford it at this point. They can't. And actually, they could have afforded it in the past, too. <laughs> but it's the profits were certainly there, but uh, you've seen like a decimation of uh, the grocery industry. Like, Law of Laws has taken a very hard line approach. Like, you've seen wages and benefits being eroded over time, actually, in the grocery industry. I worked in it for uh, a short period of time myself uh, when I was just coming out of school, and it, it, w it wasn't too bad, but then it's, it very quickly went downhill where you're seeing like a situation where it's uh, very low wages, very poor benefits for people that are working very hard. And it's even worse for people now uh, in the midst of a pandemic. Honestly, asking for $2 an hour is very little to ask. People actually should be entitled to a living wage. That's what they should be actually be getting. And having that going forward, even past like when we're out of the pandemic. These large businesses, they're not suffering at this point. Why not share a little bit of that largesse with the people that are out there? And yeah, like that petition that we have is asking for that uh, return of the what, what's called the hero pay for these people that are putting their lives on the line. And, you know, is that too little to ask? I don't think so. And actually, the industry should go even further and just implement a living wage completely, like permanently going forward for people. That would make 
any sense. So, John, you uh, look like you want to pipe in there? Yeah, there was a, uh, I saw a message today from uh, Dan Price, and uh, he's a, a former, well, a current CEO, actually, that uh, used to get paid millions of dollars for being a CEO and cut his own pay down to 75,000 U.S. dollars a year. He didn't pay all of his employees 75,000 dollars U.S. a year if they were making less than that. What he said today is that Jeff Bezos of Amazon could give 148,000 dollars to each of his half a million warehouse workers and still be richer than he was before the pandemic started. The bonus they will receive instead is 0.2% of that. Uh, yeah, and the same happened at Loblaws in Canada. I mean, they're making money, and they, as Larry said, they cut the pay, and it's, it's ridiculous. So on uh, your side as well, do you have any questions for Albatross, either as a, a developer kind of still with their skills warm in the field or uh, otherwise on your side? I wonder about the Fediverse more. I don't know very much how to compare it to Twitter and whether is it more comparable to a, a BitTorrent uh, sort of idea of, of creating communication or where, are there centralized servers and uh, you could, if you could explain Fediverse a bit more because I don't know if Larry knows about it compared to using Twitter to, for mass communication. Go ahead, Albatross. Uh, well, the comparison to BitTorrent uh, is not uh, quite valid because the exchange of messages uh, is taken by uh, instances of where people are registered with, which they are using. Uh, so so let's say uh, when uh, my uh, when I post something, I get uh, I do notify another instances where if uh, I'm probably wrong here uh, I don't know I think uh, my instance is notifying another instances which I'm federating with that I posted something new or I did uh, I spiked something or I did uh, posted something and other types of activities I can do. Uh, the Fediverse in the current state my, looks uh, more like an email than a bit torn. Uh, so there is an, another problem with this because while we say it's uh, just wise, we still have uh, an instances with uh, maybe and, and by instances like, he uh, means the, the particular servers yeah. in question, right? Like the mastodon.social is the biggest or one of the biggest instances or servers of the Fediverse. Powoo.net is another. Gab used to be one until they broke their federation, etc. Yeah, the, this one. See, uh, I think it's uh, fair enough to say it's decentralized, but uh, we need to, to keep in mind that all uh, that all magic happens on the server side. So if anyone, uh, if someone wanted to take down the Fediverse. It uh, could happen by uh, taking down the biggest instance at this moment, and this will cut off the the most people from other fr from their friends. Unlike BitTorrent, BitTorrent is impossible to, to take down. You know. And from Larry's side, uh, do you have any questions in terms of either public policy in Russia or otherwise that you might have about the trust? Well, I'm just uh, wondering, like, uh, the situation there with uh, Vladimir Putin's opposition. Do you think he might be getting out anytime soon? <laughs> oh, I'm not uh, so good in, uh, in politics because uh, I'm trying to distance myself from it. But uh, I think that you heard what's happened with the uh, opposition uh, so-called leader. Uh, he's not actually a leader, but for most people, he's, uh, I guess, uh, he's the, the probably most important person at this time. You know, what's uh, happened to, the, to him. And I think that probably he... Uh, wait a second. Um, I think he was poisoned, but, but of course authorities say, no, we didn't. Uh, he, didn't <laughs> he didn't do it himself. Which, of course, is not true. I guess no one will just uh, put, their, put themselves for a coma for a week, for a week, <laughs> uh, just to, you know... So it's oh. kind of like the mirror image of Jeffrey Epstein here in the West, I'm, I'm, from the sounds of it. But uh, from Albatross, from your side, do you have any questions for Larry or John here in... Uh, to the Larry, it's not like a question to the Larry. I think 
uh, when he uh, explained what's uh, happening in the Canada right now with the lockdown, with the virus and stuff, I think that something tells me that probably our authorities are just copied. <laughs> <laughs> just copy uh, our scenario uh, from each other because what you're telling is actually happening in Russia too. Well, it's not like a question, but it's just interesting coincidence, I think. Uh, well, so the John, I mean, I don't know what action to, to ask, <laughs> to be honest. No problem. And uh, John, from your side, any questions for Larry? Now that I know you two are in the same city, so you guys probably are closer than we are from here in Saskatoon. But uh, do you have any questions for Larry now that you have him on the line? I, are you still taking the bus, Larry? Yep. And have you heard of, like, cases that come up on the bus? I know they were reporting occasionally, like, that when there was a COVID patient known to have taken a bus route. I don't know if they're still doing that or if people are paying attention. And I remember months ago you were saying that people wearing masks on the bus was not at 100 percent mandatory and do you find that that's being adhered to it's definitely much much better now i've noticed like with uh people i've talked to and uh, the times that i have taken public transit it's pretty much universal now that people are wearing masks now that are on the buses very few times have i seen it now that uh, anybody has gotten on a bus without a mask. And often, I don't know if they're doing it all the time, I know one person's gonna get on a bus. They didn't have a mask and the transit uh, driver, they offered them a mask, they gave them a mask and the person took it. They didn't make a big deal about it or shout at the person or get abusive. I know I've seen some situations with transit workers in other cities where they've had, it's gotten kind of nasty. Uh, unfortunately, where, you know, a transit driver's just informing a person that it's mandatory to wear a mask and people have gotten a little abusive and that's totally wrong. But at least the time that I saw it, the person took the mask and they didn't have a problem with it. And yeah, it's, it's great to see that people are uh, now pretty much universally wearing masks on transit. And you see a lot more people are wearing masks now. Well, now that the uh, mask mandate in public places has come out, it's become much more common that people are wearing them, and you see people uh, often wearing masks now. So it is, I don't think there's a, it's it's becoming more socially, maybe it's socially acceptable or something. Or like but, normal. Uh, it's bringing in the normal. law, it's sort of prompted people to actually wear masks more, which is good to see. It's also worth pointing out, if it seems like Canada and Russia and the states to a smaller extent are copying, pasting their rules from how to deal with COVID from one another or from somewhere, there's a good reason for that, by the way. It's because both of our countries have signed on to the, the, the International Health Regulations of 2005 Agreement through the World Health Organization. This was something that, the, to their credit, the Harper government did get us into, which was basically a way for countries to work together in the event of a global pandemic. It was organized as a response to SARS, and I guess Russia is also part of it since 15 June of 2007. And that is almost certainly where these rules are coming from and why there is this like lockstep in terms of with other countries rather than with what's actually going on on the ground and why we probably haven't seen the restrictions ratchet up in response to the last wave in part because since the beginning Trump has pulled the United States out of the WHO so part of that guidance probably came from the department that no longer exists it's like a organization without a head almost at least that, that may be what, one of the things that's going on. But as far as Larry, do you have any questions for John now that you have him on the line? Well, yeah, I'd like to ask John, well, how are people, I know that you know a nurse, how are people in the, the like in a nursing doing like in the hospitals? Uh, what have you heard and what is your personal experience? What would they like to see happen like immediately, like right now? I'm concerned about, uh, you know, what's happening. Happening there. Uh, they haven't shared specific uh, ideas about what they'd like to see, but they do recognize that the government isn't doing as much. That from their observation of the uh, testing, like the drive-through testing facility, it's been backed up. And I know from just watching the testing numbers occasionally that we weren't testing at full capacity. And right now, that I think the person you're referring to is waiting on a COVID test since Monday and has not heard since Monday whether they're COVID positive or negative after their workplace did a test because they found a person in the building that had COVID so they tested everybody because a staff person had brought it in so they tested residents and staff and they found an asymptomatic 
person in the uh, residence that they otherwise wouldn't have detected as having it. So they're still waiting on that. So that's concerning. And I know of several people online who are still waiting for test results days later. So our testing is not at where we can depend on it to do contact tracing, to isolate people in time to slow down the spread of the infection. So it's very, very dangerous, I think. And the Premier has spent time this week criticizing the Prime Minister about where we are in the queue to get vaccine. Vaccines, well, health is 100% a provincial jurisdiction and the federal government just tries to coordinate nationwide and make sure that provinces stay on task and provide additional help like they've done to the provinces. And the Saskatchewan government has not spent uh, millions and millions, maybe hundreds of millions of dollars that could be hiring more contact tracers, which will become moot sometime maybe next week when the caseload will get to such an extreme point. We would need apparently more than 900 contact tracers working full-time hours and the government has started advertising for volunteer positions to do contact tracing. So they're not even willing to pay people to do this critical activity that can keep our economy working without a lockdown, presumably, if we get things under control. And uh, I'm just going to point out there that, one, uh, I applied to be one of those volunteer contact tracers, and I'm still waiting to hear back from them, or at least I like sent out a, a request of, hey, you know, I'm willing to do it. I've got the time on my hands. I will take off work if necessary. Just let me help you with this. And two days later, I've heard nothing from them. So clearly they're not taking it as seriously as they probably could if they're that short. And two, one of the problems that I don't think we've hit yet here in Saskatchewan, but we're going to very soon if cases keep increasing, is the rule up until this week or so was if you test positive, the SHA is going to tell you within two days, within 48 hours, yes, you're positive. And if you're not positive, we could take up to a week uh, to tell you that you're not positive. And yes, they sometimes the week turned, in my case, turned into 10 days, etc. But there was always this implicit understanding that if you didn't get your results back within 48 hours, you were negative. Well, now the, the testing is backed up enough that we may not be able to actually get people their information of whether they tested positive or not in 48 hours. And people who are positive are going to assume that they tested negative because it's going to hit that 48 hour mark. And they're just going to go back to work. That's going to be a mess if that starts happening. But we are getting near the end of the show. So Larry, do you have any last words to tell the world now that you've got the world's attention? Basically, all I'm going to say is, I don't know if the premier's listening at this point, but uh, I, I would just, if he is or if anybody that uh, works with him is listening, I, I'm just asking you, please, don't just focus on the economy at this point. Focus on people's health. Put the resources in where they're needed. Like John was saying there, for contact tracing, pay for those positions. You know, we need that. Lock down at this point and then put in the supports to help businesses and people be able to ride it through, make sure that they're looked after and there's the funds available that they can keep things, uh, at least that they have at this point, and not fall back, that people can keep their homes and people can keep their businesses. Put that as a priority. I'm just asking that the Premier uh, just take the steps Put public health first at this point. Think about the people's lives. That's what you should be doing. That's and all I want to say. John, on your side, is there any last words you'd like to tell the world? Well, I think I'll add on to Larry's comments and step them up a notch and tell the Premier to F all the way off and resign. <laughs> <laughs> because doing a, a, pretty blunt. <laughs> doing a really crap job and he's killing people and he needs yeah. to go away. Well put there, uh, Sasboy. And Albatross, hey. do you have any last words to tell the world? Well, science <laughs> yeah. on many topic is uh, just uh, COVID-19. I think I will uh, support the uh, Mari sports. However, uh, I don't really want to think about it so much, but, but something tells me that a uh, virus uh, is going to be with us for a long time, a really long time, as much as we... I think even vaccine will will not help or the first time so much, but it will help to decrease the people who died, uh, to decrease the number of people who died from the virus. Most people are, are just uh, not even not to say if they are either infected or not. However, I think that, yes, uh, it's going to be for a long time, it's, and we need to 
just live with it somehow. And on that topic, I just mentioned a little bit before the show, although we weren't thinking of COVID yet, the last show that we had with Sasquoy on, we did talk a little bit about learning to live with a different kind of world. And I, I just want to refer those of you who made it this far into the show, go re-listen to that one, because I think everything that was said is still valid today. And it's still worth thinking, especially if we're thinking that this could turn into a long-term endemic uh, infection of humanity, that it's worth thinking about what would that actually mean to our personal lives, etc. So with that, I will recommend all of you go to Saskboy's blog uh, and to Test Out Husky, Albatrosses Project, and to Larry's Basic Income Group. And with that, I will log off for the week, and I will see you all next week.